Hi, I'm Dr. Dan Ratner, and this is Crushing Doubt. With me, as always, is Julie Conrad. Hi, Julie. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, you know, excited to to hear from from people about how this is all going. You know, this is yeah. this is my baby. That's right. So today uh, we are having on Eric Sherman. He he's a great favorite of mine. He is uh he is a TMS therapist, a mind body therapist, and he was kind of key in my story of recovery in a certain way that he doesn't he didn't even totally realize. You'll, you'll see in the interview as we talk about it, but one of the things that uh was central, I'll just allude to it so I don't ruin the interview, mm-hmm. is that I had a lot of doubts about things. When I first discovered Sarno and the mind-body idea, I noticed it was working, but I had a lot of doubts about how far it would go. And I needed to have some questions answered. And I, I think one of the things I wanted to talk about today is, is the importance of getting doubt alleviated in any form. Actually, it's funny. I was thinking about when I started out my private practice, I've told people this when I when I supervise them. One of the hardest things about starting private practice, the hardest thing about starting private practice, is the self esteem hit mm. that you take when you're not getting clients. Mm. And yeah. you, you know you you have your own practice as well, so you can relate to this, I'm sure. Yeah. But you've got to overcome the doubt that you can you can do it. I mean, when I first told people what my fee was, I had doubts about whether I was worth that. And Oh, that's a huge one. That's that that right huge. there. I know I have lots of friends too in the same it's a common doubt with most people is you know, they know. I don't even think it's a a, a question if they know they're worth it. I think they most of us know we're worth it, but it's how it will be received. Yeah, but you know, the way I think about that is it's like you know you're worth it, but you also don't. Mm-hmm. At some level, you don't. Like intellect- and, and this goes along with symptoms. Mm-hmm. When I work with doubts in relation to symptoms, you sometimes know intellectually, no, I don't have doubt. This is a mind-body issue. I know it can go away. I know I can do it. But when it's not going away, it's because we don't believe it mm-hmm. in here. And when I went to see Eric, one of the main things was that I did not know how to think about any of this stuff. And I had all of these questions for him. And getting those questions answered alleviated some doubt. But even with doing this podcast, mm-hmm. one of the things that naturally comes up for anybody, I think, when they start a new endeavor is, is can I do this? Do you remember when, um, <laughs> I don't know why this is coming to mind, but when, when Conan O'Brien started uh Oh, on, on the Tonight the, Show? When you, on the Tonight Show. Yes, yeah. And I watched him that first time, and I could tell he was not comfortable. Mm-hmm. I was just like, oh. I, I remember home, watching Jimmy you know. Fallon, same thing, because I was paying particular attention because I could imagine what, I mean, the shoes he was walking into, you know, as far as that show, the legacy of that show. And yeah, like, I mean, how do you, how do you feel SNL comfortable And he's that? made it an incredible hit. Well, and I, right, I think everybody needs to know they have to give themselves time mm-hmm. to settle into something, mm-hmm. you know. And and uh, I'm I'm doing that here, but it, you know, <laughs> I'm doing that here for sure. I, I, we're, I think we're both doing it. The funny thing was, you know, after our first episode, I spent the whole week just like beating myself up about everything I was I did wrong and how I felt and how I sounded. And of course, I, I still am. I'm learning to deal with that. You know how this is a new thing for me. And uh, I remember my husband saying to me, "Isn't that what your show is about? Like, it's like crushing <laughs> exactly. doubt." <laughs> exactly. So look, we're leading by like, example. He's like, "All you're doing is doubting everything, Julie." And I'm like, "Yeah, you know what? You're right." <laughs> you came to the right show, Julie. You, you're allowed to. I, have I knew here. I was here for a reason. <laughs> I mean, but seriously, we, we, I guess we're modeling by, by having these, these doubts. I mean, it, well, and, it, and who are I, we to, I, you know, just to, that we're, you know, broadcasting experts. No, we just, we, you know, we're here to share this with as many people as possible and we're doing the best job that we can, you know? Yeah. Well, and I, I said to you, it's, it's easier for me because I've been on shows before. Right. So I, and part of what I know is it's a process. And, and I say this to people in relation to, to symptoms as well. Even if I get people to get past their doubt, mm-hmm. 
you shouldn't expect that you're never going to have doubt again. Right. Well, I find it, it, I like to use the words like being gentle with ourselves, you know, as we're going through doubt, it's not just that we doubt it in the present tense, right? Is that we're, you know, in a process of being gentle with ourselves as we move through doubt. It's kind of how, how I, I work with myself with that, but also, you know, using those words, seemed, people seem to kind of understand that the word gentle means, you know, be gentle with yourself. Don't try to uh, and I like yourself that. up. I think that's, though, I, I would say that's like the first half of it because you've got to give yourself the space yeah, to absolutely. be in a doubting position. And that, that I think, is what you're talking about. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I, I also think, too, when we're talking about, you know, pain and, um, and suffering through, you know, these mind-body situations is that, you know, when we are confronted with this in our body, you know, it usually is there's a whisper of it for quite some time until it's a, pretty much stops us in our tracks, right? And when by the time we're seeking out help, whether we've been passed from doctor to doctor or we've tried a couple of therapists, that we're really starting to think about, you know, how much this is affecting our life and that it's not even just about is it, you know, what's going on with me? It's really how can I get rid of it? How can I, you know, and when someone, even a friend, right, or, or a family member says to you, you know, gives you the support that you might want to hear, I find that it's, you know, through a physician or a doctor that for some reason, the power that they hold to, you know, heal us can also harm us if we don't receive the compassion along with, you know, just the, just talking with them and experiencing how, you know, we just want to be heard. It's, it's a great point in multiple ways, but I wanted to highlight one particular thing, which is when you're having chronic pain or other symptoms that you don't know if they'll go away, it's a tremendous point of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And it's not just vulnerability to the symptoms. Mm -hmm. It's like to the whole world. I remember that time period where I was struggling and I felt vulnerable to everyone just mm -hmm. all the time mm -hmm. because whatever they would say about it would either set me on a better path or it could send me into a dark hole and nobody really understood that. And then I like what you're saying from the vantage point that when you go to see a professional about it, mm -hmm. you're even more vulnerable. Like I know what it's like when people come in my my door, or in this case, my, my computer screen because we have a pandemic, so nobody comes in anybody's door anymore. They don't even make doors anymore. I'm kidding, <laughs> they do. But when people come to me, I know the vulnerability that they have. And I think that, I mean, I've heard this from many people. One of the comforts that they take is I've been in their shoes. Mm -hmm. They know that I'll get it. But people who haven't often don't get it. They can say certain things that don't help. And then it's the, pra it's the practitioners of all different fields that really have to up their game on this. It's it's mm -hmm. to me it's not it's not optional. Well, it's like what in you any said, we have caring to, profession we have to not to know hold, this. We have to hold space for the patient or the client or whoever it is to 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 give them room to feel like they can be heard because I know and you know, you walk into a doctor's office you know, bing, bang, boom, you're out of there. And they've got 24 more people to see that day. And, you know, everything that you may have felt like you wanted to say, you didn't get to say. Um, and there isn't the, the physical space to have that conversation. And so when we do, you know, pay for time to talk with a therapist or a social worker or someone, we have that space. And, if we can even get it off of our chest, I think we're on our way to healing. I, th I think that's true, but I, I wonder what you think about this. To me, as I went through the healing process, and not just with pain and symptoms, but actually as I started to reflect on the therapy process, mm -hmm. I've really altered my practice because I understand doubt and how important it is. Mm -hmm. When you go to see somebody, let's say you're seeing the therapist, mm -hmm. and they say to you, don't be so hard on yourself, you know, you, and, and that's a great message, but can we actually enact that? 
what I've found is you can't enact anything. If well, and what does that. that mean? Don't, don't be hard on yourself. I've been being told that since I can remember. And I don't know. Yeah, and I, I do a horrible yeah. job with it. And I'm really upset with myself about, oh, wait, well, and, it, and it's kind of like our, na- at least it's just my nature to be um, not hard on myself, but um, to have an awareness about myself, you know, and I know that what is being said to me when, when, you know, my mom or, you know, my dad would say that is just be gentler with yourself, right? Just, you know, don't hurt yourself with, you know, these words or this expectations or, um, but it's, it is, it's frustrating. It's to hear the things that you already are used to hearing. I mean, we're, you and, know. and you can't enact them. You know, you know those moments, those aha moments in life mm-hmm. or in a session. This is something I've come to really think about. When you have an aha moment, essentially what's happening is suddenly you have no doubt about something. You suddenly understand it fully. I just saw you have an aha moment. I did it. Enlightenment. <laughs> yes, like a moment exactly. Moment of you know clarity. So when you when you get those moments. It changes the direction of your life. It changes the direction of what you can what you can do. And I think this is really important in the practice of therapy. You know, you can certainly talk about it in your field or any field. Mm-hmm. But in the therapy process, I think there's a, a, a feeling that you just work and work and work at it. Mm-hmm. And you just give more time and you give to the process. I, I'm, I totally respect the process and that process needs to happen. But I think process without aha moments becomes a lost, uh, I was going to say a lost art. That's not right. A lost cause. It, you just end up going over and over in circles, but you need those aha moments. And sometimes and those so I want to take moments, those, those moments sometimes happen when you're leaving and driving home from the session, right? Or, oh yeah. Or so it's not just that they're happening. I think what you're saying is it's not just that you have them in the room with the therapist, but that you're having them, um, at some point during the process of your treatment is that that's kind of yeah that is definitely what i'm saying the other thing that i'm saying though is i think there's a way to facilitate those aha moments instead Mm -hmm. of just waiting for them Mm -hmm. i think if we can get more active that's what works and actually that so this is a good lead-in to the interview because when i met with eric i i made my own aha moments i came in and i said i need to know these things I need to not have doubt about these things. I don't know how I exactly knew that. Who knows where it came from exactly, but probably from previous therapy experiences or I went to, you know, I went to see a great child analyst when I was a kid. So I'm like extremely versed in therapy. I'm precocious. (laughs) So with these things in mind, you know, I really, I'm excited to talk to our guest, Eric Sherman. He was, he was one of the original therapists that trained under Sarno um, and with the original uh, therapist who trained with Sarno, Arlene Feinblatt. And I was fortunate enough to, I actually talked to Sarno once, but I, I got to really talk with Eric. So up next, Eric Sherman. So I want to welcome to the show, Eric Sherman. I'm, I'm so thrilled to have you here, Eric. Eric is one of the original psychologists that worked with Sarno on figuring out how to, how to implement TMS treatment. And we're going to get to hear uh, all the stories from, from back, well, not all the stories. He's got plenty of stories, I'm sure, but we're going to get to hear a bunch of them. And that's kind of where I wanted to, to dive in, Eric. But uh, you and I, in my life, go way back to the time when I was suffering from TMS and I came into your office in the kind of pain I'm, I can't even imagine anymore. And we're going to talk about that some too. But can you tell us a little bit about what it was like in those early days? How did you originally get involved? So um, I did my internship at what was then known as the Rusk Institute of Rehabilitation Medicine, which is now part of NYU Langone Medical Center. And as an intern, um, we had to choose which rotation we wanted. And for the first rotation, they needed a male on the children's service 
And even though I had no experience working with children and had no interest in working with them, <laughs> my chromosomal endowment trumped my um, clinical abilities and I was impressed into service. But because I was a good sport about it, I was told that the second time around, I would have my first choice and my first choice was to work on what was called the pain service. And that was the service that was headed up by Dr. John Sarno and by Dr. Arlene Feinblatt, whom I describe as the mother of all pain therapists. Um, people can often trace their lineage. Like I was trained by Arlene or I was trained by someone who was trained by Arlene so on that service, so this was 1984, they had both an inpatient and an outpatient component. And this will be shocking to the viewers and listeners by today's standards, but there were patients that would be hospitalized as inpatients on the pain service for 16, 18, 20 weeks. And during that time, yeah, I mean, now insurance <clears throat> just would not, you know, um, allow for that. It's just not an option. And um, we would see people who were on gurneys, in wheelchairs, people who were very, very, very severely symptomatic. Uh, there was one woman who had turned into a veritable pincushion from all the injection sites for the Demerol they were injecting her with to manage her pain upon, you know, admission. And uh, the inpatients met every day with Dr. Sarno. They were seen in individual psychotherapy three times a week, and they were seen in group therapy twice a week, and they would also attend Dr. Sarno's evening lectures. So as an intern, I was very fortunate, which is why I had uh, wanted this rotation, because the psychotherapy experience was extraordinary to see patients three times a week and to also see them in twice weekly group <clears throat> psychotherapy is virtually unheard of outside of an analytic training institute. So um, that's how I happened into this world. And uh, I tell the story, you know, this was a seed that fell on very fertile soil because when I was growing up, uh, so I'm now 69 years old to give you a sense of, you know, reference. So in the late fifties, when I was eight years old, my mother developed severe incapacitating back pain and she underwent all the available treatments that were being offered in those days, traction, bed boards, um, corsets, physical therapy, steroid injections, and nothing was working. And finally, they decided to admit her to the hospital for that, so they could perform a myelogram, which is very rarely form nowadays with CAT scans and MRIs, it's almost become extinct. But what they do in a myelogram is they withdraw spinal fluid and then they inject a dye into the spinal canal and then they tilt the patient so they can observe the flow of the dye if there are obstructions, leaks, et cetera, et cetera. So after the myelogram was completed, the surgeon, and I emphasize the word surgeon, came to my mother's bedside and said, Mrs. Sherman, at least 70% of your back pain 
is caused by your troubled marriage. I suggest you get help with your marriage and that will help your back. If I operate on your back, I will neither help your back nor help your marriage. And my parents, I know, I know. That's why I'm telling you this story. And my parents did um, involve themselves in marital treatment and my mother's back pain significantly remitted for a very long period of time. And just to anticipate questions and or uh, doubts, she was asymptomatic even when she was older and the anatomy of her spine had not changed. So she had pain and no pain with the same spinal anatomy. And she had no pain with the same spinal anatomy that was now even older. So- Now, uh, how, how aware, I'm oh, sorry to interrupt there, but how, but how how aware were you of this as, as she was going through this? Uh, I was probably more aware than I should have been, but that's a whole <laughs> another matter. Well, you, um, I mean, you ended up being a psychologist, so right, of course. Yeah. I mean, more efforts should have been made to uh, filter what I was uh, exposed to. I shouldn't have had a front row seat to this, but I did. So, um, so that always clearly stuck in my mind. Um, on the other hand, I had, um, for years as a kid, in quotes, a bad stomach. And my parents dutifully took me to the pediatrician and they finally said, oh, he's very anxious. And they gave me these tranquilizers, which helped a little. And then one day I had my appendix out and the surgeon asked my parents, had I been complaining of severe abdominal pain for maybe the past year or two or three? And they said, yes, why do you ask? And, it's, uh, and he said, it's obvious from the inside of his abdomen that he's had multiple prior subacute episodes of appendicitis. So, um, and mm, after my wow. appendix were removed, I never had the stomach problems again. So I've had a healthy respect. I've developed a healthy respect that the mind can inflict all kinds of problems and also heal all kinds of problems. But you also have to diligently rule out medical problems that's the first step and um so i like that, that you're saying that because um, because you you know you're capturing that it's so important for us to be careful about things that could be medical i always i say this over and over and i think it's our responsibility as psychologists in this field to keep saying get checked out by a medical doctor to make sure most times people come to see us they've seen tons of medical doctors but you also right. spoke to the other side which is a surgeon in the 50s knew that back pain could be about a marital issue that kind of thing and and you experienced it in your direct family which shows us it it used to be that way so you're giving us the full the full spectrum right right so in a way when i came to ruskin started to work on the pain service it was a seed that fell on already very fertile soil. And I was very fortunate because I was in those days, I met, I would meet frequently with Dr. Sarno. I would, um, I was intensively supervised by Arlene Feinblatt and two of my colleagues who were instrumental in my training, because they were already on the staff there are uh, Dr. Fran Anderson and Dr. Neil May. I should say Neil, Catherine, 
doctor in May because people often think when they hear Neil May think that they're dealing right. with a man. Right. She's, so I say Neil Catherine, so they'll know. And um, so they also participated in my training. And then after I completed the internship, I stayed on at Rust and worked there for about another seven or eight years, mainly on the pain service and uh, worked closely, you know, with Arlene and Fran and Neil. And as I said, there was a very active inpatient service. We would see tons of outpatients. And um, the training was rigorous and intensive, and it was comprehensive. And one of the things I lament today is there's really no place or situation where someone can avail him or herself of that kind of comprehensive training. It's been kind of like um, patchwork. People, you know, absolutely self, yeah. self-directed. So that's you know, so that's how it all began. Yeah, I mean, I I certainly found that to be the case. When I went looking, you know, for for the viewers and listeners, I I did end up meeting uh, with Eric for supervision for a while, and that was for multiple reasons. But it, one of the reasons was meeting with an individual about it is doable, but there's nothing set up for a, a greater framework, or not not a whole lot. It's something that I'm actually working on, and maybe I'll put my head together with you at some point about how I do that and. Uh, get your ideas about it because it is really interesting. I, when I hear about the days of Sarno, I can hear, and it probably was in part because of him and maybe Arlene that there was this sense of leadership and and putting it together in a comprehensive format. And so mm-hmm. it's, that's what's so fast. Among other things, it's one of the things that's so fascinating to hear about what your experience was like. So, what was that training like, and how has it continued to inform you? So one of the things the training did was edify me. I would see people come in contorted in excruciating pain. And despite my background, I would say, oh, that couldn't be, in that case, psychologically (laughs) driven. I mean, the, the severity of the pain, it there has to be something wrong. And I would be frightened when I would approach the patient. And luckily for me, Arlene and Fran and Neil and Dr. Sarno in his own way, all, you know, provided a steady hand to guide me. You know, that's how you're feeling now but you'll become familiar with this. And and that did happen. So it convinced me over and over and over again the power of the mind to both create illness and to cure illness. And I've seen it with people who were very severely afflicted So now for many years, um, those kinds of patients don't frighten me the way they initially did because, and when I supervise people who are encountering those patients and they're terrified, I understand why. And unfortunately, the way things are today, they don't have, it's impossible for them to get the breadth of experience to see that happen over and over and over again and with many different people. And in fact, when I was in um, my most recent analysis, uh, I would periodically talk about my work and my analyst, who is a very seasoned, well-respected analyst said, you know, 
most people, if the patients you're talking about walked into their offices, they would freak out. And I laughed and I said, <laughs> I talk about these patients with Arlene and Fran and Neil, and it's just like, you know, another day's work, so to speak. And mm -hmm. uh, so that is something the training did. And plus, um, expertise. You know, I was taught by experts, and that is always an advantage, no matter what field you're trying to, um, you know, develop expertise in yourself. So, uh, and I would say one of the emphases of the training was that you're not so much a pain psychologist, you're trained to be an excellent clinician because pain presents in many different ways and there's not a cookbook approach to this. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask you about this. Um, this is not where I was initially going to head, but now that we're here in this conversation, I feel like this is a good place to go. I've come to feel that the language of the body, what the body is saying to us with its symptoms is so important in therapy that I, I actually can't even imagine doing therapy without it now. And so it's so interesting to me to think about the field of psychology in general and how it's just, you know, people will come in and say they have back pain and the psychologist basically says, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. You know, they're, they're not, they're not going to deal with it. But I, I, I think I probably, I, maybe I said this to you back then, but I don't remember when my ideas evolved on this or even if I may have gotten some ideas from you. But I think of symptoms in the body as a waking dream. And when we, you know, a good psychologist will use dreams, especially a, a dynamic one, is going to use dreams and what they mean. But dreams are fleeting. We lose, we lose track of the, the, what's happening. But the, the symptoms in the body are right in front of us during the day. Well, that's, you know, I wrote a paper called A Cascade of Errors and I compare the fate of a patient going to someone, a patient with pain going to someone who's familiar with Dr. Sarno's work versus someone who, seeing someone who's well-trained, heart is in the right place, but has no experience with this. And the person who's familiar with Dr. Sarno's work, the pain, the symptoms are forms of communication. For the clinician who is not familiar with this, the pain is more like static. It's not meaningless. It's an unfortunate event in life caused by aging, illness, and then the goal is to figure out how the person is adapting to the losses imposed upon him or her by aging, illness, or injury, as opposed to what are the feelings that are causing the pain. It's just a completely different, you know, orientation. And as a result, you get very different results. Absolutely. And it, it I mean, I, I like the way you put it. And if we think about it that in the in that light what it means is a part of the patient is being completely missed right yes well i would say even more than a part of the patient because i have had therapists call me up on many occasions and sometimes their motivations are mercenary they don't want to lose the patient but more often than not it's they don't understand that, you know, the knee bone's connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bone's <laughs> connected to the hip bone. They say, well, you treat the patient for the pain and I'll treat the patient for everything else, as though this were smoking cessation, so to speak. And right. as a result, it's you miss the whole patient because that part of the patient, as you just put it, is connected to, is dynamically connected to a whole. So you're really just 
missing the boat completely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I have a slightly different way of putting the same thing. Um, but I, I'm love I'm loving to get your perspective on that. Uh, um, and that makes a lot of sense. I, what I found is that even if I called it a part of the patient, I think in a lot of ways it is the most important part. It is the core of who we are because that's what we're born with. We're, we're born into our bodies that we, we express with our bodies. So we, we're dismissing a, a major, uh, the most major component. And what, hey, this is really interesting. And I, and I want to, I want to talk with you about this because my work has evolved. You know, you and I, we've kept up over the years, but mostly over email. And so you won't know exactly where my, my work is right now, but Interestingly, um, what you just said is so, well, let me get to the part where I came to see you because it's, okay. it's very, it's about this because I came to you, uh, hoping for, yeah, you do the pain and I'll, I'll keep seeing my, my therapist. And I think so many people do want that. And your point is very well taken. So when I came to your doorstep, it was August when therapists go away. And luckily you hadn't gone away yet, or maybe you didn't go away in August. I don't remember, but you were there. And my analyst at the time, who I was having a kind of difficult relationship with, which was the first time I ever had that with a therapist. And and it was partly because he did not, I, I would tell him about, you know, I want to work on this back pain. And he said, analysis is not a cure for back pain. And I was like, well, you're out of luck because that's what I'm here for. <laughs> um, it was the reason I came. So I came to see uh, I came to see you, Eric, because I had read um, Sarno. I had started to feel like, yeah, I think there's something here. And I went to see you. And that, that session is one of the most uh, seminal events in my life. And you... Uh, we we talked about this before before the interview of course you wouldn't remember it like i did you you know it didn't have the, the the heavy meaning it has for me but for me i came into your office so desperate for a sense that i could be helped and i got a ton of help and i'm going to explain how it you know felt for me um but it also it influenced something for me and and in ways that we may differ. And of course that's okay. And we'll banter about it. But, um, when we sat down and I told you that I was in an analysis, I remember being a little crestfallen cause you were like, Ooh, you know, I can't, I'm not going to be able to do this work with you if you have, uh, you know, a previous relationship going, cause I don't want to interfere with that relationship. And that it, Clinically speaking, it's extremely appropriate and the right thing to do. You want to protect that relationship. But I so wanted you to be a back consultant. I just was mm -hmm. like, help me with this. So, And then you did something great, I, I, I think. And really, I think we both did something great, which was I advocated for what I needed a little bit. And I said, okay, well, even if that's the case, can I ask you some questions? And I remember just peppering you with 200 questions something like that and you patiently answered them and it was like we were just knocking bowling pins down for me it was mm -hmm. like okay now i can set that one to rest and so this was very formative for me that one session because i got so much out of that session what it taught me at least about me was that my doubt was driving so much of the ship whereas i had read in sarno it's all about emotion and of course as I found with Sarno, he's pretty much right about everything, but the, but the, we can expand what, what he knew. And one of the, the very first expansion for me was that session with you kept resonating with me, how important it was that I got those questions answered. And it made me, it made me wonder if other people needed that, but I'm curious to know what, what your take is on that session, just hearing my, my take on it. So, as you describe it, it comes back to me, and I would say pretty much I'm on the same page as you in terms of that my recollections correspond with yours. 
Um, I, I didn't experience it as, as powerfully because I had, shall we say, a different, you know, I was a different kind of stakeholder. Um, but I will say this, something I hear all the time, and it's one of my pet peeves, and that's putting it mildly, people will tell patients on chat rooms, unless you accept the diagnosis 100%, you are doomed to suffer and you cannot be cured. And frankly, that is just not true. And that kind of dogmatic approach is actually very unhelpful to say the least because people are going to have doubts and the only way their doubts are truly going to be dispelled is if they see results. That's what will convince them. And until they experience a, an appreciable and sustained improvement, they're not going to be convinced, nor should they be. Why should there be a different standard of proof when it comes to this than it would be for anything else? If you mm -hmm. have a respiratory infection and a doctor prescribes an antibiotic, if you feel better in three days, you believe, okay, the doctor prescribed the right antibiotic and made the correct diagnosis. If you don't feel better, you start having those doubts and those doubts will propel you into further action. The other thing, what I tell patients now, and the other thing is, if you tell patients, you have to believe, you have to believe, doubt is the enemy, then basically you're telling them covertly, you have to stifle your doubts and those doubts cannot be part of our relationship. And right. I can't think of, well, there are probably worse ways to derail a therapeutic relationship, but that's <laughs> a, a good way to start. And you want to, you know, the patient to be comfortable telling you whatever he or she is experiencing and that this will not offend you or threaten you. And what I tell patients nowadays is, I expect you to have doubts, but if you can walk and chew gum at the same time, meaning you can have your doubts, but your doubts do not prevent you from reflecting on the possible relationship between your physical symptoms and your emotional experiences, then we can work it out. Whereas mm -hmm. if the doubts prevent you from engaging in that, then there's really nothing there's no work we can do, but most people can do that. I, I, I love what I love listening to you say these things. And it's, it's always so interesting because I think you and I have differing viewpoints that are really saying very much the same mm -hmm. things. So I've always thought, <clears throat> you know, what I needed to do is get rid of doubt. I did need to get rid of it, but it did need to be there. I can't, you can't get rid of doubt without letting it be. Right. Of course. And, right. and I think that, I think that's what you're saying. So, my viewpoint on it, very similar, is we work to dial down doubt, but you can't dial down doubt without them actually believing it. This is not a matter of faith. You know, one of my favorite right. lines, one of my favorite lines in Sarno is you, you need, you don't need a leap of faith. You need a leap of information. I think that's how he phrased it. And that's how I see it, that my job is not to just try to will the person to believe something that they don't, because that's not going to help. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just going to drive them away from me and really drive them into a battle with their symptoms. And then they'll start shaming themselves for, I don't believe enough. It goes down this horrible rabbit hole. And so, yes, I, th I think, you know, I wanted to say also the, the meeting I had with you, I didn't, I didn't actually experience it as seminal at the time. Um, I, it, it was extremely helpful at the time. And I knew that. But what happened is the more I reflected on it, the more I saw how important that session ended up being, or at least that my questions and getting them answered was. And uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, there's that famous Mark, quote, Mark Twain quote, 
when I was 20, I thought my father was an idiot. When I was 21, <laughs> I, was amazed, I was amazed how much he learned in that one year. And <laughs> I, I love think, that quote. Yeah, and I think that's uh, a template for many of our experiences that when we see a movie for the third time, reread a novel, reflect on something, we're able to appreciate things that we just didn't get the first few times around and mm -hmm. i and i think the fact that someone is open to that is you know remarkable because that's in a way what makes therapy work yeah i mean it's interesting because my meeting with you was was both it was it was this thing that was like wow i got a huge amount out of that in one one session and it kept, you know, the Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't come away skeptical from it. I actually came away sad that I couldn't meet with you more because I, at the time, I'm having this difficult relationship with a therapist that I, I really, if I think about it, I was breaking up with him. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a long time coming, and I, I, I ended up ending it with him in part because, do you know Michael Golinski who did All the Rage? You probably. Yes, because uh, you were you were in it, so of course you know it. Um, but Michael and I were talking because I was an associate producer on on that film, and I was talking to him about this analyst, and he said, "How could you? How can you go to see somebody who doesn't respect what you do, or or like can't even entertain what you're thinking about?" And that was another seminal moment for me. Uh, that increasingly loomed large over time and i i thought about you versus him and uh, you know i never went to see you for therapy but actually one of the workarounds we did which i really appreciate that you offered was hey i can supervise you on this and we can you know in the margins we can you can apply it to you and um it also was very validating for me just like you said to to work with an expert and feel like you have some of that knowledge it was very helpful for me going forward. Now, now I had at my back a medical doctor, Dr. Sarno, who that was important to me. If I had just read a, only a psychologist about this and there was no MD right. involved, I would have, I, I couldn't, I, I don't know if I could have accepted it in that way. And then to have your expertise added in, and this is, I, I'll give myself a little bit of a pat on the back. I'm very good at knowing what my questions are. <laughs> so it made it really easy easy for me to come into your office and ask all those questions. So one of the things that I do, not everybody's as good at knowing what those questions are. Sometimes they need help articulating those questions. Right. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about what, what my work looks like now, because it's very different even than it was two years ago. I don't know if you'll agree with this, but I'm just going to say who I am and we'll, we'll deal with it. Right. Um, so I started doing these short-term consultations that I wished were available. And, you know, I was, I was very, I had to be very clear on a lot of things. And, I, and that conversation I had with you continued to loom large in it as I thought about, you know, um, it is good to make sure that I'm not interfering with treatment relationships. It is good that um, I'm allowing myself to kind of think for myself and, and expand the field if, if need be, and maybe provide something that some people feel they need, but I've got to do it the right way. So I, I thought a lot about it and it's just what you said. You know, I, I allow for a space to bring out the doubt, to just lay it all out on the table. And essentially what I do is that these are consultations of essentially four sessions, generally speaking, sometimes they're a little bit longer, sometimes they're a little bit shorter. And we go through um, what I call different columns. There's the emotions column, which is just, you know, it's pure Sarno. What are your main themes that are contributing to symptoms? How does the timing of them match up with what emerges physically? What does it mean? Then there's the doubt column. And this is all stuff that I, it's kind of how I pieced it together because it was, there was no Sarno and Arlene Feinblatt, you know, just cranking out things for patients. Um, and I found there, there's different levels of doubt. Is it TMS? Is TMS quote unquote curable, which I know is a kind of um, difficult word to use, but uh, reducible or manageable or whatever we want to call it. 
Uh, and then I found there's a lot of doubts that people have about themselves and maybe about their specific symptoms. Well, can, I, can it be done when I've had it for 40 years? Or can it be done when it's this type of symptom? And those are the kinds of questions that I was peppering you with. I remember asking you about a car accident I had been in. Uh, I was probably 15 years before that, maybe. Um, no, maybe 12. But I was like, can that cause it? And you were like, no, injuries heal. And I was like, oh, thank God. And those were the kinds of questions I got answered. So I, I've the third column is something I call power because I found sometimes, and these are just the different snags I hit. And I checked it out to see, does it apply with other people? I, I don't want anyone to think I just said everybody's like me because no, we're all different. But these are different tools we can use to understand TMS. And p the power column to me was about the fact that TMS is not just a distraction from your, your emotional life, but it's also a communication. What is it trying to tell you? Mm -hmm. And it's embracing you, your self-relationship. And then the fourth column is these action steps that I came up with myself about, okay, you know, if I'm going to do a physical event that I know could be triggering, I need to think of that as a trigger and I need to think of the emotions and I need to think of the strength of the body. So I've just created this whole list of action steps. And, you know, it's interesting what I've found is, um, you know, obviously by the end of four sessions, uh, there are times where I significantly reduce pain in that amount of time, but it's not like I'm replacing therapy and they don't then have work to do. It's, it's a little bit more like what I imagine some of what Sarno was doing with his lectures because it's very information driven, but it's also very powerful. So I'm just curious what you think in hearing that, how that sounds so I'll, to you. I'll tell you, my friend and colleague, Fran Anderson, is both very fond, and I guess because she's fond of it, she's become extremely proficient at seeing patients on an intensive, short-term consultation basis, as you described. And... I'm sure there is overlap conceptually between your two approaches. I'm sure there are areas where there's divergence, but I think that's a, I think what happens is as you mature in your profession, whatever that profession is, you start to identify what you're good at, what you're not so good at, what plays to your strengths, what uh, circumvents your strengths, and you try your best to work in such a way that you optimize those different factors. So even though I have a great deal of respect for what Fran does and sounds like you're doing something analogous okay and i have a lot of respect for that approach when it's done thoughtfully that is not for me because i'm a different kind of person in the same way i always tell people i could never be a couples therapist i would be a disaster and because I know myself and I know what would work and what wouldn't work. So it seems to me that you have figured out a way to optimize your interests, your strengths in a way that also dovetails with certain patients' needs. Because let's face it, if you can appreciably reduce symptoms in a relatively short period of time, I mean, the benefits for that are self-evident on so many mm -hmm. different levels. So um, I think, you know, there's a big, there needs to be a big TMS tent where different modalities are available. And it's not just, well, this is what I do, so it's the right thing. There's, you know, totally. a danger with that. 
that's um, my reaction to it. And I find it interesting that Fran, independently of you, is doing something that there's a lot of overlap to it. That That's really interesting here. And I, I didn't know that. Yeah. I, I've... I've met Fran, you know, during the the training that that you did. I, we th- we think it's in 2013, but we've both lost right. track of the time. Right. And uh, Eric and Fran um, ran a, a master class on this, and uh, that's actually where I met Neil, uh, right. who is Neil now who is who is now actually my therapist. I don't know. If she she may not oh, want me to mention that. Get, Sorry, well, Neil. <laughs> Let me put it to this way. Neil would never say that. So this is news to me. <laughs> okay. She yeah. Well, of course she wouldn't. <laughs> right. No, she's no. Uh, and she is, she is the best therapist I've ever had. And, and some of it was I, after I left that analysis, you know, I had already been in supervision with you, so I didn't go to you for that, but I, I, I would have been comfortable doing that, but I, I knew I had to go to see somebody who at least understood TMS. It, I couldn't, that was a prerequisite at that point for me. And I had already, because wh- when I got better from the back pain, I said to this analyst, so, okay, I know you say you don't believe in this, but you're you're looking at me. What do you think happened? And he said something that was so astounding to me because it was so unscientific. He said, and I'm not meaning to malign anyone here. I'm just, uh, but I'm trying to, convey what people go through in these things. And sometimes they, they're with a therapist who doesn't believe in it. He said, I just think your back healed. And I was like, you think my back magically healed in three weeks when I discovered Sarno? And he held on to that. And so this is a, a part of what I do and part of the reason I like the short-term work, although I totally appreciate it's not for you. And there's a reason it is for me, and I'll explain in a second, is that, um, you know, I... I like to banter about the logic of it. I really, I really do. And then the short term model allows us to get right to it. And I suppose, and I'm a very patient person in a lot of ways, but I had done therapy for, you know, about 15 years by the time I discovered, um, discovered, uh, Sarno and TMS. And you learn things about yourself. One of the things I learned about myself is I wanted something more. I wanted something different. And that was appealing to me. That was exciting to me. And so that's part of the the horizon. But I'm also a very action-oriented person. And I think sitting in nine and a half years of an analysis that really wasn't working so well, it got me very excited for action. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. and I, I, here's another thing. I When I started working with TMS patients, I would essentially get their symptoms reduced and then i was just doing therapy again and i totally i respect therapy i think it's wonderful and um i even think of myself as a very good therapist in a long-term way i have some long-term patients that we're doing really good work but i like many different things and this allowed me to expand into another another way without it being that every time i helped somebody I had a long-term patient and then I couldn't help more people. And that's another thing is I want to reach more people. And it's one of the reasons I'm doing this, this podcast is to reach more people. Um, and that, that's, that brings me to my, my last question, which is, I, I wonder how we can think about, well, I, I, I'm curious what you think about the, the way we dialogue about this, you know, because one of the things I want to do is to, to change the national dialogue, which I believe is very much changing. And it's been exciting to see some good ways in which I think it's changing. But I'm curious what you think about about that. Is that something you're, you've had your eye on? And just what's your take on what's happening? So I don't remember what colleague or patient I mentioned this to in the last week or so. But I've been doing this now for... 36 years, and when I first started doing this, the vast majority of patients were told they needed surgery, and without surgery, they were doomed. And a lot of them sought out Dr. Sarno, not because they had insight, but they were afraid of surgery. And Mm, yep, nowadays, Patients will come to me, as you said, 
they've off by the time they get to us, they've often seen six, seven, eight doctors, often of you know different specialties, and they will say to me, "I had back pain. I went to an orthopedist." He or she ordered an MRI and identified a herniated disc, but the orthopedist said to me, that isn't causing your pain. Lots of people have herniated discs and don't even know it. And they might be doing karate right now without any <laughs> problem. And for all I know, you've had this herniated disc for the last 15 years and it didn't bother you. So then the patient will say, well, what's causing my pain? And the doctor will say, I don't know. Few of them take the next step and say, it might be your emotions. But to say, I don't know, is a lot better than saying, it's this anatomical problem that we can fix surgically. So in that regard, I would say, the national converse, I, I don't know that I can say the national conversation, the conversation in the New York area is yep. definitely yep. changing a great deal. It might be true for the rest of the country, it might not be, I just don't know. Um, and I think the challenge is that the problem is ubiquitous, but the concentration of expertise to treat it is very concentrated. It's, very. you know, 85%, 90% is in New York. You have a little in Chicago, a little in Los Angeles, and uh, a little bit in Washington, D.C. And if you live outside of those areas, you're kind of screwed. Yeah, I mean, I'm the only one. I'm the only one in Northeast Ohio, and I think the, like one of two in Ohio, as far as I know. Okay, so that's um, yeah. So I think th there needs to be uh, training of various professionals, but training doesn't consist of. I went to a workshop and read a book, so now I'm trained, or <laughs> because uh, I had TMS and I got better, I'm trained, and my retort to that is always, then every woman who has given birth can anoint her, you know, present herself as an obstetrician because right, she had right. a baby. So <laughs> I don't know how, I'm not a good systemic thinker. There are people that are much better at that, those sorts of things than I am. Um, but there clearly has to be a way to make the need match with the resources. And right now, there's a really terrible mismatch between the availability of talent and the need for these types of treatments. Uh, absolutely. And and the one thing that I'm encouraged by is I think the interest in these things is growing and the openness to it is growing. And, and I do think that is at least somewhat national, although it's hard to measure, obviously. But, you know, my feeling about it is uh, similar to yours. I think that training people in this, certainly awareness is important, but I have plans to to work on the training aspect of things. And I think the more people who know about it, the more dialogues that are happening about this is better. And that's that's why I, I'm doing this. But, you know, as part of my – so I'm writing a book, which I've been writing now for eight years. And it's funny. The book gets better and better the longer I wait because I keep learning things. And the, uh, at one point I realized I'm writing four books. I got <laughs> And I cut and paste it, and I have a shorter book, and it, hopefully it's going to come out soon. Well, no, it is going to come out soon. I should speak more definitively. But one of the books that I read during that, and we'll finish on this, is Pathways to Pain Relief, which you and Fran wrote together. And one of the things that I think is great about that is the collaborative um, aspect, which interestingly doesn't often happen in the TMS world um, we, because we all understand it in our very unique ways. And it's a little, sometimes it's hard to do. And, and um, I understand the Spanish version is just coming out. Is that right? 
It just came out a few weeks ago. Yes, it's Caminos Hacia el Alivio del Dolor. And, it's, uh, and we were very fortunate. We worked with a very gifted translator, Sergio Quiros. And uh, for him, it was like, this is in Google Translate. This is, you know, artistry. Uh, he's really very talented. That's wonderful because the things you say, the things that you say in this book and a lot of the people who have written in this field were saying very, very subtle, nuanced things. And to, to have it just translated into, you know, whatever Spanish version, you, 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 need, you need a maestro. It yes, sounds like you found one. We did. We did. We were very lucky with that. We were very lucky. So where, where can people get, get the book, Eric? Uh, it's available on Amazon. And it's in Kindle format or, you know, in soft cover. So one great thing about this book is you, you hear from Eric and Fran. So you get you get two, and they work together. So you guys came up with certain ideas that you agree upon, and then you have your your, your different, not necessarily different viewpoints, but your different uh, narratives about it. Right. We're different people with different styles. I would say we are in fundamental agreement about things, but the expression of those ideas looks different when you have different people with different personalities. I will say that your book was by far the most useful book for a clinician right. trying to figure out what to do, how to, how to work with this as a clinician. It was extremely helpful and so insightful. And I'm not surprised because I, I know you, but I want to thank you for coming on. It, it, it means a tremendous amount to me personally as well because of the part of my journey that you played and you and the part of this whole TMS world that you played. It's uh, I loved having you on and uh, hopefully I can get you on again at some point. And I would, would well, you keep up, of course. You either anticipated my thoughts or your telepathic. I was going to say I thoroughly enjoyed this, which actually didn't come as a surprise to me. I went into this expecting I would, but I enjoyed it even more than I thought I would. And I would, if the opportunity arises, I would love to talk more about this because Hawaii and TMS are two subjects. Don't get me started <laughs> on if you're not prepared to listen. So thank you. All right. Next time we're bringing you on to talk about Kauai, especially is my favorite island in Hawaii. But uh, okay. I, I, I like, very much I prefer look forward the big to that. Island. I prefer the big island. I haven't been. So, I, oh. hey, I've got to go. You Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Thank bye. you so much, Eric. So how was that reconnecting with Eric? It was really great. Um, you know, he and I have kept up over the years, but I haven't actually gotten to sit down with him in a long time. Yeah, I was wondering, first, like, how long how long it's been? I mean, I'm guessing it has. It's been at least five years, and yeah. and we we've we've emailed about some things, but you know, it's it's just a it's a very different experience because when I was first going to see him, first I was recovering, mm -hmm. or trying to recover, and then I went to get some supervision from him for a little while, for probably about a year after that. And um, but interestingly, as you see in the interview, we we diverge in how we like to work. And some of that is based on what he likes to do and how he thinks about it. I was just curious to know what your what your first impression was, you know, when, when, when I first when came you, to see him. Yeah. When you very the first time you saw him. You know, it's interesting. I think this is going to capture th something from uh, for people who are suffering or even people who have recovered. My first impression of him was so radically different than anything else because all I cared about was getting better. So mm. I almost wasn't taking him in that much. I was mm -hmm. just like, I showed up at his doorstep and I was just like, help me. Mm -hmm. And so my first impression was all about, can this person help me or not? Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, that Did he first just wave meeting. you in, like, come on in and let's... <laughs> yeah, I mean, he. I do remember, he, he. although it maybe melded with other times that he came to greet me, but um, yeah. he's a very warm guy. Mm -hmm. As you see from the interview, he, yeah. he talks very slowly in this calm way. And mostly that's really good 
from a, a like pain recovery sort of there were times where i was like come on tell me more and and so right that's part of part of why i was like i have to get in all of these questions but but he's so what open. was really interesting yeah you know like yeah as you were both talking about how how you work you know it struck me that he's very open to you know whatever avenue it is that you're you know working from and that you're able to, you know, connect with the patient, you know, with with what they're going through in the moment and, um, you know, just being accepting of where you're at. Yeah, he, he's certainly a very accepting person, but it's um, he's a nice combination of providing really good information without being judgmental in any direction. And yes. That and that that came across. I I feel like I really enjoyed how he he answered some of your questions and knowing that you know um, he's been doing this you know for a long time as well. Yeah, and I mean, it was really interesting to talk to him about that one session because I don't even think I told him about it back then or even when I was going to him for supervision. And I think one of the reasons I didn't is that it's more in reflecting on it years later, mm-hmm. seeing that that was the model for how I crushed out. It actually really mm-hmm. was. Um, I just knew instinctively what I needed was the answers to my questions, that I was tired of going around from doctor to doctor or mm-hmm. to chiropractors or acupuncturists and getting all these different answers. Mm-hmm. And having read Sarno and then going to see someone who knew about Sarno, I, I trusted a lot more. I can get real answers from this person. Mm-hmm. And then the next thing that happened that really changed the whole picture is his answers made sense. Mm-hmm. That was astounding. And, mm-hmm. and I can tell you there are people who will be watching this and they'll tell you they've gotten tons of answers that make partial sense mm-hmm. or they've gotten tons of answers that make no sense. Right. And so yet, he was kind of the guy that put it all together for you. I mean, you had, you know, you had read, you knew. Was that before you had met with Sarno or talked with him? Um, I'm trying to remember. N- no, I actually think I contacted Sarno after I talked after, to Eric. Okay. Because, so he, so because then he, he truly kind of brought that connection for you in that moment where it just... He did. He did a lot for me, for sure. It was a lot of loose ends. Exactly. Sarno was still the guy who pulled me out of the depths. You know, it was it was his book that changed the way I was thinking about everything. It was his book that helped me see some actual results. Um, But that being said, I guess it was a combination, I would say, of three people. One was Sarno. One was Eric. And can you guess the third? I bet you can. No? Me. <laughs> I was going to say that, but... <laughs> yeah, trust your instinct, Julie. So it's this gotta is very be important. You. It has to be. It has to be us, right? Well, the, see, that's, that's the thing. I mean, a lot of times people come to see me and they think that I am going to solve it for them. And I provide them with great information I provide them with a lot of great insights. I can get people places very quickly, faster than many, because I understand these things so well from having experienced it. But there are times where I have to say, okay, now you have to know you can be powerful. One of the, so in these short-term consultations I do, there's the emotions column, the doubt column, and the power column, and then we get to the action steps. Mm Mm-hmm. The emotions column is very in line with Sarno. You figure out what your emotional themes are. You figure out how they're relating to the the symptoms. The doubt column, which of course is where this podcast derives its name, is all about being certain not only that it is a mind-body issue, but being certain that mind-body issues can be uh, alleviated. And then also, and this one relates most to power, being certain that you yourself have the power to do it. There's so much self-doubt everywhere we're, we're taught to doubt ourselves mm-hmm. you know we look at all these people who are having if we're looking at celebrities for example mm-hmm. who doesn't look at a celebrity and think i can't do that i could never do right. that how do they do right. that and 
self-belief is not not easily done. And then if you add in that they're chronic pain sufferers that never thought they'd get better, that self-doubt is just amplified by Yeah. And and they they're told to, right, if you oh you're a chronic pain sufferer, then you've already you've kind of labeled yourself as something and once you have that label, you're just kind of owning it, right? If you're telling people, I have chronic pain, I have chronic pain, you know, it's it's almost that think it, believe it, feel it, live it, you know, where then it becomes that storyline that I think what you're saying and what happens is you're breaking that storyline for people and saying, you know, that's not true anymore. You know, like you gotta put that out of the way and look at, look at what's really going on with you, yeah. with doubt, with, with um, power, all those things. And I think particularly for women, we deal with that a lot of being in a workplace or, you know, in certain sorts of um, relationships or whatever Running it might for be. President. Yeah, right. Exactly. Stepping mm-hmm. into um, that. And there are, there are extremely powerful women who do own it. I mean, you know, you watch the documentary on Hillary Clinton, you watch the documentary on, you know, Michelle Obama, you see these people and you know that they are experiencing, they're human beings, they're experiencing all the same things that we are. But there's a, there's an authenticity to their power. It's not like fake it until you make it with them, right? You can see that, you know, from the back when they were kids, to college, to, you know, where they are as a professional, that that, you know, that is something that people can walk into and own it and live it. And then why are some of us stumbling around knowing that if that's a possibility, we have beautiful role models, but yet we keep tripping, (laughs) we keep tripping over the... It's true, but let me bring in a point that I really like to make all the time, um, that fits with how to get better from symptoms, but also fits with what you're saying. Because as you were talking, I was thinking, oh, it's so interesting you said that about Hillary Clinton and, and Michelle Obama, because to me, they're two very different, they're obviously two very different people. They're different people in terms of their power and their belief in themselves. So uh, I've, I've read Michelle Obama's biography, so I you know, f- found out more about her and, and what this was all like for her. I think I haven't read Hillary Clinton's biography, but I, I'll work towards that. But she, Hillary, I feel like had more self belief right from the start. Mm-hmm. Um, Michelle, I, I feel like even at the time that Barack Obama was running for president, she was still finding her. She was finding her sea legs, from what I could tell. Mm. It, it was, and that's what she kind of talks about in the book as one one of the things she talks about. So I I do think is that, that more, do there you think are some it's more upbringing or circumstance or personality. I mean, you know, I'm going to say something that might feel controversial and certainly would bring up um, a lot of different conversation. I think more than anything, it's a decision. It is simply a decision. And when do people or decide? Unconscious. Uh, well, it can be an unconscious decision that people make, but if you're going to get control of it, it's got to be conscious. And Mm -hmm. the vast majority of people, it's conscious. Mm -hmm. I decided, I decided to be powerful after the back pain. It's not that I wasn't powerful in any way, but when I got better from that back pain and I saw what could happen, I've said this before, I'm not a particularly spiritual person, but if there was anything that could make me believe that there is some, um, higher order to the universe, it was this. I was like, Mm -hmm. I was a kid who somaticized all the time. I remember my mom would go away and, you know, even just out for the night and my knee would hurt. And I knew, I knew even as a kid, that is that. I don't know how I knew that. I don't know if it was like my child analyst told me that or or what, but I was a kid who really knew about mind-body experience. And then here I am going through this horrible pain and I just was really on my own for a long time but I figured it out Mm -hmm. with uh, you know some great help especially from the information that I got from people and suddenly I was a person who could do something different and meanwhile as I said Sarno got me partway Eric 
in that one conversation got me part way, but I, I was the one who structured that conversation. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I knew what I needed. And I, I just, I was starting to get a sense that I could be powerful. And, uh, so the theme I was going to talk about was this idea of moment to moment thinking that mm -hmm. you can't think of your doubt or your power as something that just is like you were saying, you don't want to label yourself a pain sufferer necessarily unless that feels good to identify with that, but you don't want to feel stuck there. If you think right. in moment to moment terms, because mind body issues relate to what's going on in the mind. First, you always have a chance to be powerful. And that that's why it's a decision. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was the answer. Well, I know it wasn't the answer you expected, but I'm curious what you, what well, you think. It, about it sounds it. like a practice to me. It sounds like something that because of the way life unfolds, right? That, you're going to have moments of feeling powerful, but to walk around like you're all, you always have a cape on wouldn't be human, right? That there are yeah. times where I think the more you practice it, the more you live it, right? Because, you know, life happens and suddenly, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and no, you know, we lose our job. Our kids are in school. There's all these things going on where all of a sudden, we don't feel in control. We don't feel that we have, you know, the control that we once had, which affects the way we feel in the world. And I feel personally that that kind of um, is, you know, a practice of just stepping into it and owning it and then stepping back and, you know, taking each of those moments. I mean, would you agree? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that some people use mind body thinking to get rid of a symptom and then they move on. But mm -hmm. I would say the majority of people, that's not what happens. That's what you read about in the books. But those people usually go on to practice. They uh, mm -hmm. not not necessarily uh, practicing in the way that I am, where I'm actually treating people with the pain, but practice how to think. So my action steps, I said this to somebody recently, my action steps, you could call them actions, but they're really they're thought actions. How do you think? Right. And that's all about a practice. You know, one of the reasons I'm so confident about doubt is I have resolved my doubt about symptoms thousands of times because I have some little twinge every day of some kind. I can just make it go away in seconds. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, it takes more than a couple of seconds. Earlier today, I had some back pain back here and I had to think about this is because you're doing too much and you're feeling frustrated about it. And I just by pinpointing that, it relaxed. That's just one of all these different action steps. I have a, a PDF I think I've told you about of like 140 right. different action steps. What they really are is a practice, the sum total of my practice of how to do this. So let me let me shift gears for, for a second. Every episode, we, we like to answer some questions from people uh, or I just bring up questions that many people have. And in this case, that's what I'm, I'm going to do. So um, when people come to see me, this is a question that comes up a lot. Does everyone have doubt? And that's so interesting because it that is a form of doubt right there, that question. <laughs> you know, sure they're like, am I, the, am I the only one? Is there something wrong with me? These are the kinds of questions that people have when they come in. And so here's what I'll say. Not only does everyone have doubt, even the ones who think they're totally certain, doubt is very insidious. It can creep in there in the subtlest ways, especially if you, if you factor in that if you have any doubt about yourself, that's a way that it can creep in. But I also want to say not only does everyone have doubt, everybody has a mind-body issue. We are all mind-body beings. So you can have different levels of, and, and, you know, you work in, in Ayurvedic uh, medicine, essentially. So what do you agree with that, that we are like mind body beings? Oh, completely. I mean, you know, the way that that Ayurveda, which is, you know, kind of a we describe it as a sister science to yoga um, in, in Indian medicine. Um, we look at it as in three different types. So different people experience their their doubt and their um their physical symptoms differently so you know 
it's it's all the same as what you're saying. It's a different language in a sense um, of you know what we call someone that has more of the air element, air and space element in the body. They their pain will move all over. So we'll find you know we, we will see that um, and that different times of year they will have an increase in that. So it'd be fascinating to you know work along say you know, you and I are working with the same, you know, patient and, um, or client and to see that, oh, you know, this is their, their nature, the way that their body is, they are more likely to flare in the fall because that is Vata Hmm. season. So it's a little, it's a little more than the scope of, of what we're talking about here to go into, but that it's such a fascinating thing. Whereas someone that has more of an earth element in them, um, they will experience things more as a growth or a swelling or so you could almost predict what you're going to experience. Um, where like, you know, if you said, here's a batch of people, they always get back pain, but here's a batch of people that get stomach issues. And here's a batch of people. And, Ayurveda tells us exactly why that is, because there's a certain nature to their body that is going to present that way. So it, we should, it's We it should totally do, a, we should do a, a consult. Because, uh, I, I, you know, I feel like you're learning a lot about what I do, and I'm now learning a lot about what you do. Yeah. That, that stuff you're saying is... It's like you're speaking my language, but it's a different language. Um, well, exactly, and it, it it's so. And and to your question, like, absolutely, we we look at the mind is the mind itself is your health, right? Your if you if all disease starts in the mind is what I'm trying to say, um, and that's exactly you know what you're helping us understand is that you know that whole psychosomatic experience, or even pathologically, like the pathology through the body starts with the mind. And people will, Mm -hmm. you know, look at you like you literally have a third eye, you know, on your head (laughs) when you say that, you know. (laughs) Which if that happens, that's a mind-body experience too, but I've never seen that one. Uh, (laughs) You know, we've been talking about how people, different people are, are different. And, and a lot of times people do come to me and say, why, why do these action steps that people have prescribed for some people not work for me? And they get very worried about that. And that is a form of doubt as we've talked about. So journaling is a good example. People mm. journal a lot for these things and they get a lot out of the journaling. Certainly nothing against journaling, but some people don't do well with journaling. And, and I'll, I'll give you an example. The kind of person who um, is very aware of their feelings already, spends a lot of time on it already. And they start journaling and they say to me, I don't know why my pain starts going up when I'm journaling. Mm. And I think it's because they are either experiencing some emotional uh, thing that they aren't aware of, or they're sick of it. They're tired of going over and over and over. They need a different solution. And this is one of the reasons why doubt can be extra powerful because a lot of times those people are not getting the answers they need either in the medical realm or the emotional realm. And doubt is kind of the one in between. But my, my rule of thumb when it comes for, to well, what, well, let me say this also. A lot of times people will come to me with doubts. Can this this particular symptom or this part of the body have a mind-body experience, and not only are we mind-body beings, but our whole bodies express things all the time. So if the body can do it for one thing, it can do it for another. I'm going to say that thousands of times on this podcast if we do thousands of episodes. I suppose I won't do it thousands of times if we don't do that many. But But I think people, I think that is so extremely comforting to hear. And I hope people right now that are watching are feeling a sense of relief that you know, all of this, all of it, it's, it's this mystery of our, of discovering right ourselves, like what, what we are is unique. And, you know, we have a path that we can go down. But it's the one thing about Ayurveda that people like is that, look, it's not a one size fits all. It's a one size fits lots of different people in lots of different ways. And, Mm -hmm having 
at a relationship, whether, you know, you're, you're working with someone one-on-one or they're following, um, you know, protocol of kind of here are some action steps that there's options and that they don't have to rely on, you know, do A, B, and C. Though I'd have to say a lot of people just want to do that because it's easier, right? Like if I, you know, which where it's our nature to kind of just find the easiest way, right? But yeah, just sometimes we can't, you know, we, we have to just do a little bit of detective work and, and dig around a little bit. So I love that point and we should pick up on that at some point in the near future. Thank you for watching. Please click subscribe, hit like, and ring the bell for notifications on YouTube. Sign up for our newsletter on crushingdoubt.org for information on new episodes or to sign up for my live seminars. You can find us on all social media platforms at Crushing Doubt. For questions you would like answered, please email us. To keep our podcast going, please consider a donation on Venmo at Crushing Doubt. I am here to help you resolve your doubts on your journey and find powerful, peaceful, and happy living.